Well, good evening, everybody. I'm going to start from over here, and then we will uh, use different parts of the stage for different types, parts of tonight's program. Um, so good evening and welcome. I'm David Leonard, president of the Boston Public Library and occasional moderator and host for some of our series. Um, so we'd like to welcome you, whether you're joining us here with our limited capacity in person or online via, via Zoom, or perhaps you're viewing the recording at a later date. Tonight's program is part of our fall author talk series and also our recognition of November as the National Native American Heritage Month. And then for the first year in 2021 in Boston, we also recognized October 11th as Indigenous Peoples Day as a holiday. In addition to city and state funding that supports the work of the library, private donations make programs such as this possible. For additional details or to become a supporter, please go to bplfund.org. And now our institutional acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the Boston Public Library's central library stands on land that was once a water-based ecosystem, providing sustenance for the indigenous Massachusetts people. We recognize the devastating effects of settler colonialism on their communities, their contemporary presence, and we as an institution commit to land acknowledgements for all locations at which we operate throughout what is now the city of Boston. Our program tonight will begin with a keynote address by our speaker. We will then have a conversation about his work and take our first set of audience questions. This will be followed by a drumming performance and a few final questions and closing out the program at about the 90 minute mark. If you're joining us via Zoom, you can use the Q&A button to submit questions and one of our staff members will relay them to us during that part of the program. We will also have microphones roving in the room to pick up questions during that time as well. For those wishing to purchase a copy of the book, our bookseller uh, partner tonight is Trident Bookstore and Cafe. Uh, you can find them online at tridentbookscafe.com and use the sh free shipping code BPL ship, or you can visit our, their nearby Newbury Street location, or of course, check out your local library or independent bookstore. And, and now to this evening's guest. Larry Spotted Crow Mann is a nationally acclaimed author and citizen of the Nipmuc tribe of Massachusetts. He's an award-winning writer, poet, cultural educator, traditional storyteller, and tribal musician centered around the intersection of cultural and environmental awareness, spirituality, and youth sobriety in the indigenous community. Man is co-director of the Okato Cultural Center, an organization that allows for the opportunity for interdisciplinary education through cultural workshops, dance, music, and art. Okato, which means a place to grow, was founded to provide a safe, rewarding, and enriching experience for the indigenous community of the Nipmuc region. Man is the author of at least three books, including Drumming and Dreaming, which we'll hear from and talk a little bit about tonight, The Morning Road to Thanksgiving, which is a 2015 Native American World Craft Circle of Honors winner, and an internationally acclaimed Tales from the Whispering Basket. The most recent book is a spectacular collection of stories of Nipmuc legends, and it is featured in a statewide curriculum across Massachusetts as part of a life skills training for teachers and students focused on alcohol and drug prevention in Native American teens. Larry travels to K through 12 schools, colleges, universities, powwows, and other organizations sharing the music, culture, and history of the Nipmuc people. Outside of man's life work with indigenous arts and culture, he has given lectures on issues ranging from Native American sovereignty and indigenous identity to drug and alcohol prevention and eradicating health inequities for Native Americans and indigenous communities worldwide. Please join me in welcoming Larry Spotted Crow Man. Thank you, David. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Thank you. 
en el medio ni lo van a mejorar tan quicia, que mata a un anta, que negocia el coco tan ni lo van. Mena tú, ¿o sé que tiene juana? ¿O mena te tío? Que no sé cómo uso a mo que ni no ho que encanto chocasis. Ni ayo. I greet you in the words of this land in my Nipmunk language. I greet you in the words of peace and reciprocity, and that during this time we would. Well, there's no exact translation for it, but in our language we say the sharing of our breaths. And when we say the sharing of our breaths in our language, that means the, the spirit, because as we breathe, we recognize that is our spirit. So we're exchanging our spirits when we speak and when we talk. And we recognize that in the, in the, in the way that when we say that when we talk, we're sharing our spirit, something that I think is forgotten uh, uh, sometime. And I also talked about that we would have our ancestors in this place that there can be a reconciliation um, amongst them uh, in regards to the different backgrounds we all come from, if they've um, been a part of uh, um, things in the past that were detrimental to, to the people of this land, that there could be a reconciliation. And so I say these words in that language to recognize that this land that we are on, which as David mentioned, the, the home of the Massachusetts tribe, we are on the land of uh, those ancestral lands of uh, my relatives who have been here for thousands of years being stewards of this land where they raised their families and had their diplomacy, their democracy, their art, culture, science, love, music, art um, for thousands of years until it was disrupted by colonialism and genocide. Um, and Massachusetts being one of the epicenters of uh, democracy, science, education has sorely lacked in recognizing the indigenous presence while it gained such uh, a notoriety in terms of the states of, of, of our country. And so with that, it's important that we recognize the land that we're all now benefiting from that we're on today. And not only say a land acknowledgement, it's important to also acknowledge that when we talk about these acknowledgements, these were part of our culture for, for forever. So whenever a native person would travel, they would acknowledge the land that they were on, whether it's Narragansett or Diné or Anishinaabe, you would always recognize you're on that land. And so, and with that comes actions, that recognition, meaningful action steps that we engage in to, to make differences on a personal level and maybe on a more regional level and a national level. And so we take these action steps by getting involved. Uh, in doing this work. And so um, I wanted to open up with that. Um, now in English, my name is Larry Spotted Crow Man. Uh, I'm from the Nipmuc Nation. Um, I am a writer, cultural educator, poet, uh, dad of four boys. And um, uh, I've been doing this work now for three decades. I have traveled to many parts of the world. And uh, just before the pandemic, I was spending a couple months in Ecuador, sharing at the University of Cuenca. Uh, there was quite the experience down there to be with the uh, tribal elders from the Amazon, and um, we'll get to that in a little bit later. Um, but uh, one, of the, one of my most recent um, endeavors and accomplishments, I should say, that I'm so proud of is that I am the co-founder and co-director of the Okiteo Cultural Center uh, out in uh, western uh, Ashfield, uh, Massachusetts. It is the first and only native-run and operated indigenous center in all of western and central Massachusetts ever, since the landing of the pilgrims, I suppose. Uh, and so we are um, doing incredible work. And anybody who wants to support this work that we are doing, I, I encourage you to go to our website, see the amazing things that we are doing. Currently, right now, as I'm speaking, we are doing our first dugout machoon. Uh, and for those who don't know what, uh, what that means is that um, the traditional canoes that we traveled in were, were burned out, literally with fire. And so we show and teach our, 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 our young ones in our community this method of, of how we create uh, uh, tools and, 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 and vessels that we travel and live in. Um, and so, and we show how fire is actually a tool to build these canoes, these, these machines. And so right now, uh, our, um, uh, we have our first artist in residence, Andre Strong Bearheart Gaines. Um, so we're able to do amazing things when we have the resources. And then we can actually pay Native people to do this work, that they're not that they're not put in a hardship just to attain their cultural, their cultural acknowledgement. Um, and so I wanted to open up with that. Um, in tonight's talk, um, as I says, as David mentioned, I, I wear many hats. I, um, I'm also the um, 
artist in residence myself at Bunker Hill Community College, and we are currently engaged in uh, another first, having the first indigenous curriculum across all uh, uh, disciplines of the school. In other words, they won't be, they won't just be some elective. There'll be a, a mandatory class, whether it's science, uh, uh, STEM, STEM work, sociology, uh, of course, history, and, and so on. But indigenous knowledge of the area will be incorporated into all the classes, all the subjects. So it's really an amazing thing that we're seeing uh, uh, happen. So I wanted to um, give a shout out to Bunker Hill for the work that they're doing and uplifting the, the local tribal people. So it's really important work. Um, so then for this, for this night's talk, I'm going to um, talk about my books and um, as David mentioned, Drumming and Dreaming, um, we're going to highlight that as well. Uh, so I, um, I want to I wanna break this talk down and uh, talk a little bit more about my work for a few more minutes and then we're going to talk about what it is to be a native writer, uh, some of the, the barriers and, and some of the things that we want to tell you as a native writer. Um, so my work, as I said, started about a little bit over 30 years ago. Um, as, a, as a desperate need because growing up in Massachusetts as a native person was, uh, can I say H-E-L-L? <laughs> Little kids don't say that word. So uh, being in the classroom where you didn't see any reflect, reflection of yourself, of your culture, of your history was detrimental to, to our people and it continues to be and this is why we see uh, all, all, the, all the different uh, 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 disparities across the board. And so th this drew me out of, out of desperation to learn more about my ancestors and, and culture. And uh, ever since I was 21 years old, I, I began this journey of um, learning and then passing it on. Learning and passing it on. And that is the key, to pass it on. Um, and, uh, and so this kind of segues in. Uh, early on, as my children were young, uh, my grandfather put a drum in my hand, and, he, and, he, uh, and so, a lot of people don't realize this, but indigenous people traditionally would have three names in their life. You would get one at birth, you would get one when a big transition happens in your life, and you would get another name when you were an elder. So when I had this transition at 21, my grandfather named me Concanto Chokeseche. It is the name I still walk with now, and that means the crow with spots. And he told me, and as he translated spotted crow in English, um, and he told me that I would... Um, and so, just to back up a little bit, the crow is a very, very sacred and important motif in our, in our Nipmuc uh, pantheon of, of, of uh, different animals and, 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 and uh, spirit animals and so on. So it was, a very, it was a high honor and I was really surprised to get that name because the crow is the shapeshifter. He is the one who travels between life, death, and dreams. And he goes into different worlds and he sees the dead and he talks to them to get information and brings it back. Um, he is also the one who was able to deal with multitude of environments. Um, and so it was, uh, it was quite the honor to get that name. And he told me, he says, son, you're going you're gonna to travel around and uh, you're going to be doing all these things and you're going to be singing and going all over the place. And, you know, and here I was 21 years old. And like, I'm like, is he, you know, I was really inspired to hear my grandfather say that. And, and uh, I was really touched, but I didn't see it at the time. Uh, you know, I, all I knew was I just wanted to learn and learn and learn about my culture. And, um, and uh, the next thing you know, here I am today, you know, with books and, and, uh, and all, all different things. And so, by, by, but carrying that with, my, with the information that my grandfather shared to me, I really wanted to sing and, and share that good medicine that I'm going to share because we're taught that that drum is that sacred medicine. So as my kids became born, we started a drum group called the Quabbin Lake Singers, and we traveled all over the place. We were known as the Native American Partridge Family. I mean, yeah, it was, it was, it was amazing. Um, and so I could talk about those adventures all day long. I mean, just the experiences being on the road and going to different countries and singing with my kids. But, um, but that, that's an important piece to mention because that, being a singer and a performer gave me the platform um, as a writer, as a native writer. And so I'm going to switch to that conversation now because that's, that, that was an important uh, pivotal moment. Um, I began writing around, um, well, I was a sad kid, as, you, as I was mentioning. So I was, a, I, was a born, I was born to be a poet, just being sad. So <laughs> it's, it's like it just comes to you. So I was writing poetry since a kid, and uh, you know, we make fun of ourselves. And, um, and so my first book, Tales from the Whispering Basket, came out in um, 2010. And, um, uh, and so I was really excited about that work, uh, that I was able to do that. Um, but having said that, so we're going to talk about 
being a native writer. And so we are probably some of the most marginalized people in terms of scholarship, in terms of epistemology, in terms of recognition, in terms of people taking us serious. And so indigenous writing is considered a niche genre, as it were. And, um, and not only that, being a new writer, trying to break into the world, I mean, I love writing, I hate publishing. Uh, they're, they're just, yeah, you know. I mean, you ever watch Shark Week? <laughs> oh, the publisher's in the room? No, okay. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> um, so I love writing, and uh, when my first book, uh, I had the manuscript, and um, I couldn't get anybody to support it, um, and I was very, very upset. Um, but what I did was I realized I had this platform as an artist, as a singer. So everywhere I went, I would, we'd be singing and performing. We'd have hundreds of people there, and you know, we're on TV. By the way, I got this book. I got this book. And, I, and you know what? If you, if you buy one of these books, I can go back to school. But if you buy two books, I don't have to go to school. So, so anyways, as being a performer, people began to, OK, I'll, I'll check this guy. He can dance pretty good and sing, so maybe he can write, too. So and the book was a hit. And uh, people really loved it. And I traveled the world just with my first book. It went to Sweden and Iceland and where else did we go? Greenland and all over Canada. Uh, really amazing places uh, and visited. Um, I heard somebody once say, traveling really changes you. Uh, and it's true. When you start to see people from different countries and different parts of the world in there, not when they come here and they're trying to fit in, right? Because we make them do that. But when they're in their country and they're doing what they do, you know, and it's a, re it's a really powerful and learning experience. Um, and so uh, I was able to uh, go to Sweden, and uh, we went to Iceland, and we went to Greenland, and, and different places like that, um, uh, um, and sharing this, this book. Um, but, but I say this because I was very lucky, very, very lucky, because I had cute kids with me. They were little, you know, dogs and kids and animals, right? You know, so I, was, I had the kids with me. They were all singing, and, you know, people were really, you know, okay, we're going to support this guy. But most artists don't have that, native artists don't have that luxury, and they get turned down, they get their door, the, the door slammed in their face, and um, so it's, um, it's a very difficult, difficult task to overcome, uh, to, get that, to get that support, um, and we're talking about people who have already gone through a multitude of vicissitudes and, and difficulties to, to try to, to, to share what they have, their stories, and there's so many incredible stories out there, and I'm going to jump to something that uh, was one of the questions that it was asked, like, what are the most interesting stories that people don't know? And I'll say they haven't been written yet. They haven't been written yet. Um, and so that's, that's important to recognize. There's so many talented Native artists out there now, and writers and poets, and it's incredible. It just gives me goosebumps reading their work. Um, and so, um, and what really got me over the top with, after I um, uh, published uh, the, uh, Tales from the Whispering Basket, I was working on a film with um, Chris Ear. Anybody heard of Chris Ear? He, uh, he's, th this is the easiest way to describe him. He's a Native American Spike Lee. He's, uh, he's pretty phenomenal. He's, in many, he's done many films, uh, some of the most uh, popular ones. He's been involved with, like Smoke Signals and uh, some of the other PBS series. So we did, um, he, he, uh, he was the director of the PBS um, We Shall Remain, and we worked together on that. And I said, uh, Chris, do you mind? checking out my book. And so he read it, and he gave me this amazing review. And, um, and it's funny, because just before he gave me the review, and I was already getting like, a lot of accolades and support, and, uh, and I said, huh, this was fun. And uh, I said, so now what do I want to write about? Because I, I said, I can write about anything. Because I'm, I'm an Indian, but I know white people, too. I know this world, right? But nobody knows Indians. And so if you read Tales from the Whispering Basket, you'll notice there was a, it's, a, it's a mixed, um, it's a collection of different things. Because I was kind of having some fun and seeing where I can go with this. Um, for example, the story Soul Inspiration is, has very little to do with uh, Native people. But I wanted to write this kind of this mystery, horror kind of story, uh, just to kind of let my mind just go, like let it free, just open up and run. Go do what you want. You know, that was that story. Um, so, but after he, I can't remember what he said word for word, but he said something like, um, uh, and, he, and it was in the paper when they quoted him. He said, uh, he says, Larry Spotter Kerman's work is what Native people need, and it's so important to have our voices heard. And I says, I, I know what I need to be writing then, more Native books. 
I got to stick to this. Because we have 100 people writing horror films. We have 100 people doing this. And I knew then that my talent and the gift that I've been given to share needs to be focused on what I'm doing. And I said, OK, so what do I do? And I said, OK, I'm going to go. I'm going to really try to. <laughs> I'm going to really try to get into some people's skin, but teach them something and share something as incidental learning, as we like to call it, but also show the levity, show the humor, show the love, show the passion, also show the sadness, the pain, the horror, in a real story. Uh, as an indigenous historian, it's so easy to give you historical facts and dates about uh, the 1637 Pequot massacre. I can tell you about 1620. I can tell you about Deer Island. I can give you dates, names. But they never seem to have the same driving force when you wrap that in a story and with, with live characters and people that are going through that emotive expression at that moment, and you're taken to that place. And so that's what inspired me to do The Morning Road to Thanksgiving. Um, and uh, this book won a national world, and I just I went on tour again when I wrote this. Um, and it was really exciting to, 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 to publish this because I knew um, I knew what I wanted to do, and it, and it did just that. You know, it, it's really changed people. I've had people from all over the world writing me who have read this and telling me they cried, they laughed. Um, it, it was, and it took me four years to write this one. Um, it, it was, it was a really a heartfelt journey to be a part of that book. You know, and um, I talk about myself in the third person as most kind of little schizophrenic writers do. Um, so I. Um, and then when people ask me, how did you do it? I said, well, I just let the characters do what they want to do. I just said, go ahead, just go. And then they went, and they went, and they went, and they told the story. And I just was kind of the medium to let it happen. Um, and so, and this book really took me over the top in terms of um, support, because I, I wrote this book from the heart, not from just trying to sell copies or anything like that. I really wanted to tell a story because it, it doesn't hold back. It talks about the lateral violence within Native communities. It talks about the racism. It talks about the real history of Thanksgiving, how the first Thanksgiving that was in 1637 was celebrating killing Indians. And, and, um, but if I told you that in a classroom or in some kind of academic book, you might not want to hear that. And it's just dry dates and things like that. But now you're seeing the history unfold, and you're seeing the results, because this story takes place in contemporary times. So when we talk about that generational trauma of indigenous people, you're seeing it in this book. You know, and it deals with some very tough topics, like I mentioned, um, uh, different things that indigenous people go through, addiction, suicide. And um, much like if any folks are watching uh, the res uh, reservation dogs now, you'll see how these heavy, heavy topics are, are, uh, are, are um, kind of levied with, with humor. You know? And so this is something, this is a, a native device, an indigenous device that we use to kind of buttress that pain. Um, and so, and um, I'm gonna, so finally, I wanna talk about uh, drumming and dreaming. Um, and so after I did the tour thing with the, the, the Morning Road, and it's still a, a big hit, especially around this time of year, um, I, I, I continue to stick to the work that, that is meaningful to me, that is meaningful to, to, to my family, my community, and my people, um, because um, while I'm here in this form, I want to continue to do that because um, I don't have time to go into my whole story, but as I said, as a child, things were really hard for me. I was near death uh, from addiction myself. And so the creator brought me back to, to do what I do. And for 30 years now, this is all I said and talked about Native people getting sober, Native people lear learning about who they are, Native people having self-empowerment. And uh, today, that gift has kind of come full circle for me to be the, the co-director of the Okitao Cultural Center, which is, as I said, it's indigenous run and led. It's phenomenal, man. It's something I thought I'd never see in my lifetime. So I just get to pass it on, right? I get to uplift so many, we have so many artists already coming through there already, like uh, um, Isaac, Isaac Murdoch and, um, and uh, uh, Susan Lin, the, 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 the artist who created some of the most iconic symbols in the, in the indigenous movement of today. Um, and we're able to uplift these folks, you know, and, and, and more and more. And so that's, what I, that's all I ever wanted to be able to do. To do. And so we're, we're doing that. Um, and, um, and not to um, forget, it's because of the allyship, the incredible support that indigenous people are getting. Again, something I thought I've never seen. I grew up in the 70s and 80s. There was still segregation and busing. And I can tell you some really sad stories about 
all the abuse and the horrors that happened in the school. And the students weren't no better. Yes, the teachers were horrible to us. And um, when I hear people talking about their favorite teacher when they were a child, and I, I get a little, you know, sad because I didn't have that. You know, they were too busy calling us savage and pulling our hair and telling us that we don't exist. And, you know, it's, yeah, sad stuff. And so I knew that I needed to change that, you know. Um, and so drumming and dreaming. Uh, this is a story, a collection of our indigenous stories. Um, and the most important thing I could say about this book is that this is our academic book. This is our Bible. This is our roadmap to how to be a human being. Um, these stories teach us everything about life, how to, how to have diplomacy, how to problem solve, how to interact with the environment, how to laugh, how to be a good person, how to love, um, how to forgive. And so, so many important lessons that we forget about and how to connect back. And so something that happened, you know, when I was, um, as I was a child, and this has happened all over the country for, for Native people, uh, as I said, we go into the classroom, we don't see our culture, we don't see any reflection. And these stories, uh, much like with the, the, do the boarding schools, they were taken away from us. And our stories connect us to the land, to the stars, to all the landscape. We are connected to it. But when that was removed through genocide and erasure in the boarding schools, we look up. And the skies don't speak our language anymore. They're speaking Greek, right? What's going on up there? It's Greek. And then we look down at the earth. It's speaking English. It's not talking Algonquin anymore. Sky Bear is not there. You know, he's now, they call him the Big Dipper or something else. And so we lost our communication and we're blocked in. We're caged in without anywhere to go. And the only way we can function is within a parameter that is meant to destroy us. And so these stories are about returning agency to indigenous people. Um, and I think something David had mentioned, every story in here is about this place. You could, you could find them. There's nothing abstract about, um, about indigenous stories. You know, they're all places, the, the lakes, the mountains, the different plants, the animals, they're all part of that story. <laughs> and um, some water. I'm watching my time here. Okay, it's about 6.30. And um, something I wanted to um, also mention about this book is that um, it was dedicated to the, um, and I know now there's a lot of conversation about uh, the residential schools and all this, the, the, the bodies that they were found um, being discovered. And if you're a Native person, this is nothing new to you. This has been on your mind since forever. And in 2015, when this book came out, uh, when I was actually working on it, it came out in 2017, uh, when I traveled to the um, Haskell uh, College, and uh, for those of you who don't know, the Haskell University in Kansas, I was there doing the keynotes address for the um, graduate uh, students. Um, and uh, so Haskell used to be one of the boarding schools, one of these infamous places where kids were forcibly removed from their homes and uh, the language was stripped from them, um, their right to leave was taken away, and they were put into this militarized Christianity form of Christianity, and uh, many were... The, the stories of abuse are gut-wrenching. Let's just put it that way. And so out in the back behind the Haskell school area, there's um, about a 600 yards back, there was an area where the kids would try to escape and run away. And many would go out there and take their own lives. And many would go out there and end up being abused by the schoolmasters and, and different folks who are working there. Um, but the Haskell students of today consecrated that area. Um, some of the graves are, I, I believe, still there, but they consecrated that area and made it and turned the area into a medicine wheel, the indigenous students of today. And they made a sacred clearing there. And so now the students would go there and have the sunrise ceremony. They would pray. They would study. Um, and when I went to Haskell, I, I was asked by uh, my good friend, Julia, Julia Whitebow, who was um, the granddaughter of uh, Russell Means. And she said, Larry, would you do the, uh, the sunrise ceremony? I said, oh, I'd be honored to. And so I went out there and you know, we, uh, there were many folks where we gathered and, um, and I, I sang some songs and I, and I, I swear, you know, I could, I could feel all these little children lined up in a circle with me and the wind was blowing so, ever so gently and it was like one of the most moving experiences I've ever been a part of. And, um, and when I 
experience that. I, I knew I, did, I needed to dedicate this book, Drumming and Dreaming, to all those kids who were put there and never got to hear the story of Sky Bear or the Three Sisters or the gift of the strawberry or the, the Toad Woman of the Swamp. All these leg legends that make them laugh, to make them learn, to make them teach them that the color of their skin and their hair are beautiful. They were all taken away. So I said, this book is for them, wherever they are, that they could hear these stories and uh, um, brighten up their spirit. Um, so I'm going to close in a minute. The last thing I want to mention, we can um, discuss that a little bit further over there, is that, um, as I mentioned, some of the most important stories that we need to tell, and, uh, tell. and I recently became a playwright, so I had that, <laughs> um, and I... Uh, uh, I was really inspired by, my by our, one of our greatest allies, the Double Edge Theater up in uh, Asheville, Massachusetts. And um, so, um, uh, you know, as we talk about the, the, the boarding school, so I come from three generations of children who were taken. Uh, the last child that was taken was my grandfather's oldest brother. And um, he was born in 1897, and he was at that right age to be taken uh, when he was about 11 years old. My grandfather was born in 1906, so he was able to stay home. Um, but prior to my grandfather's oldest brother, Arthur, the two generations prior were all uh, taken away. And, um, and so school was, um, you know, it was a pejorative, just hearing that word. And much like what happened to me, it was happening a lot worse to my ancestors. Uh, and we have two relatives who never made it out of there, uh, a girl and a boy. The boy um, was said to have drowned. He was probably trying to run away. The girl just disappears. Um, we've yet to find out what happened to her. Um, one of, that, would, that would have been my great, great aunt. Um, she was about nine years old. Um, so I talked about this quite a bit with my good friend Stacy, and um, because the story gets even more painful because um, and something that people don't know, and I'm going to end shortly, um, is that indigenous people are the most highly, are the, the highest enlisted people in the U.S. military. In other words, Per, per population of their racial group, they, they join the military more than anybody else. Um, and there's many reasons for that. And um, I did a story uh, about that some years ago in Indian Country Today. Um, there are many reasons that we don't have time to get into now for that. But this goes all the way back. So I'm a, I'm a son of the Revolutionary War. I have two grandfathers. And I have 36 relatives who were in the Union Army during the Civil War. In particular, two grandfathers at the same time. So brother, father and son were in there at the same time. And so um, uh, long story short, I, I, I've told this story many times to my friend Stacy, and she says, you need to do a play about it. Because my grandfather, uh, uh, Samuel Vickers, who was there with his son, uh, he died in the Andersonville prison as a prisoner of war. Um, and uh, his father had to come back and tell his wife that uh, his son had, had died. It was, you know, it was... Um, and so I, I knew many of these stories are already growing up because we did the history so, so long ago. But as I decided to do this play, I uncovered so much history. And I know there's a lot of Civil War nerds out there, but they, I'm sure they don't know much about what happened to Native people. I mean, the, the conditions were absolutely horrendous. And the things that I've read and learned, um, and as I said, I found out there were 36 of my relatives in the 1860s all fighting, all Nipmuc men who are closely related. So all these men, 36 gone, we're in a depleted community already. Now all the men are gone. And so, anyways, as my grandfather, he dies down there. His land was usurped because he was ward. He wasn't even a citizen yet. He was a ward of the state. And uh, his land was taken, and his children were put in the boarding schools. Um, and then that happened the following generation. And so it was, it was so jarring that, you know, I, I wrote this play entitled Freedom in Season. And I performed it over the summer, and there was... Um, uh, if you go to the Oki Tail website, I gave some highlights about what I went through as I, as I prepared for that. Um, it was another very moving experience. So these are the stories that need to be told. Uh, Freedom in Season was, was talking about indigenous people, removal, about usurped lands, about children being taken away. Um, and so um, these are the stories that uh, we want the world to know about. Right here in Massachusetts, all this history, all this stuff, right, that happened, that, that is not talked about. Um, and so, um, as an educator, that's, that's been my life's mission as, um, as a writer, to, to share these heavy stories, whether it's Thanksgiving, uh, about the Civil War, uh, these legends, which seem very innocent enough, um, but as I said, they're, they're, they're an academic book. They're, they're a roadmap to life, 
for indigenous people to connect them to this land. Because when they read those stories, they're seeing themselves, their community. Um, we certainly don't hear that when we grow up in this society where you know, we are marginalized. We don't see the value and importance of the things that we have, you know, as the term cultural capital. We don't have that. And so we're trying to return that agency to our, to our community. And, um, and, uh, and so I'll, share, I'll show this too. So uh, David mentioned the, um, uh, the work that we're doing with the Department of um, Public Health and other tribes. So this is an 11-week curriculum that we developed from the book Drumming and Dreaming, which bases healing on indigenous ways using stories, using t traditional lessons to incorporate that with life teachings and a, a curriculum to, to help combat drug addiction, uh, but also making healthy choices because that's what really starts. Uh, and in engendering um, that positive feeling that we, we all need inside. Um, and the, the, this work came out a few years ago. We've had such great results with it. This, these books are now available across Massachusetts to all middle school children because we saw how well they're working with indigenous communities. Um, and because we were dealing with a crisis that I, I think a lot of folks didn't realize, uh, between 2014 and 2016, there were 24, 24 overdose and suicides in the native community right here in Massachusetts. So for two years, we were, using, we were losing one child a month. And, um, and that all goes back to the, many of the reasons I explained, not feeling you're a part of this society, not having something reflect back to you that has a meaning, um, and, and, and so many other factors where uh, poverty, uh, lack of resources, um, dysfunctional parenting because of the folks my age and up are all dealing with this generational trauma, the gut-wrenching abuse that they've never had, never been able to talk about because they're told you don't talk about those things. So what do they do? They, this, they pass it on. And, and uh, even today, the boarding schools have closed, but now Native children are the highest kids still put in foster, foster care because of some of these systemic issues. Um, and so, uh, and this is where the, the, the important work has to, has to take place. Um, and, and I'm gonna close here and, and say that, you know, allyship is probably the most important part. And, um, and something I say, I say it jokingly, but I'm kind of serious about it because uh, when I turned 50, I got into surfing. Uh, it's, it's just probably one of the most relaxing things you could do. Um, another appropriated sport <laughs> from Polynesian people. Um, but um, it's really fun, and, and sometimes us, uh, I don't like to, I don't use the word activist, but just somebody who's just out there for the people. Um, we'd rather be doing fun stuff instead of fighting for the right to exist, just explaining that the color of my skin is okay. Uh, but we're left to do all these things, and um, we spend like 90% of our time defending our right to be here. And just imagine what we could do with that energy if we didn't have to do that. You know, write more books, do more surfing, you know, play with our kids. Um, but we're, we're in a crazy situation and, and, and something, see, I'm educator, keep talking. But okay, I'll, I'll close right after this comment. Um, if you are a person of color, you may not realize that, and you know, we brag about the US Constitution, which has been what, 352 years, I think it's, since its inception. You have only had 20% of its full access. And that's crazy, right? 20% of that constitution that people wrap their head, you know, arms around and get glossy eyed over, you know, it's, you've only had 20% of that, you know, what, 1965, and then 13 years later, I had the right to play my drum because the federal law up until 1978, Native Americans couldn't drum. Uh, 1924, we became citizens, so it's really crazy stuff. But, um, but uh, yeah, so as you see, I spend a lot of time thinking about these things because they're important to my community. And um, so I'm going to end there, and just, uh, we're going to shift to some questions. And I really, really thank you guys for, for coming out, um, especially in this crisis that we're all dealing with. I'm going to do some singing because that healing is going to be good for all of us. Kutta Badamish. Larry, th thanks so much for um, you. just putting yourself out there and sharing your story. And um, both your joy and your pain are implicit in, in what, we're, uh, what, we're, what we're hearing. Um, 
But maybe why don't we just tell us a little bit about the Nipmuc people and the geography, in modern geography, where, where would we understand we would, we would find you or would have found you? So the Nipmuc homeland is, um, I'd like to show that map because our homeland actually covers four states. Um, and it goes all the way to the, to the Connecticut River and just borders Newton. Uh, and, and that's where we border the, the homeland of our relatives, the Massachusetts. Uh, so it goes all, and then it goes all the way down to northern Rhode Island and northeastern Connecticut. Um, in Massachusetts alone, the original homelands was 2,000 square miles. Um, by, uh, by the late 1800s, our homeland was reduced to five acres in the last reservation, which is in Grafton, Massachusetts. Today, through the Nipmuc Preservation Trust, we now have recovered, through the land back movement, almost 150 acres of land returned to our people and growing. And uh, that seems like a very small number in terms of having over 2,000 square miles in Massachusetts alone, but for only having five acres for a century, uh, it's, it's an accomplishment and you know, we appreciate it. Um, these, these are now written stories. Um, I assume they were oral tradition yes. uh, sourced originally. So could you talk a little bit about the process of deciding to take what is part of the oral tradition and, and commit it to, um, to pen and paper? Yes, that's a good point. So even when I wrote my first book, I, um, I went to my elders because there's a story in there called Deal Me In. That's a traditional story. If, if, again, if anybody's seen the reservation dogs like the deer yeah. woman. So that story comes up a lot in a yeah. lot of different tribes. Yeah. And so that story has been a part of our family uh, lore for many years. So I wrote that story there. Mm -hmm. But I had to get permission first. Yeah. And um, one of my elders used to say, he says, if you want to hear the story the exact same way, read a book. <laughs> but when you're hearing it across the fire, I mean, I know it takes a little aw something away, yeah. but I knew it was just uh, imperative yeah. to get these stories written. Uh, because again, I had the platform, I, I had the opportunity, uh, and our, our community is very small. We have about 3,000 members. Um, there's a few folks now who are beginning to do some writing, and uh, my other cousin, Dee Dearheart, she writes. But it, it's the chances of having this preserved, right, was, was very risky. And it's kind of funny, um, because when I was... Um, Developing my play, uh, I, was, I played the, the, the persona of my great-grandfather, um, and so, <laughs> uh, who was in the Civil War. So um, <clears throat> I remember calling my, uh, my, my uncle, uh, Ken, and if anybody know, who, know who uh, knew who David Talpine was, he was our language writer, and uh, so his, his dad, my uncle. So I called him, and I says, uh, I says Uncle, can you tell me what, what our... What our um, what our, what our great grandfather was like during the Civil War. And he goes, Larry, I'm not that old. <laughs> I said, no, I, I said, no, but you're a generation up, so you probably got the, and so we chatted and he laughed and he sent me some more info. And so, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's a transition mm -hmm. that you just have to kind of um, accept that it is, but it's not, I mean, cause, because um, as native people, we understand that everything is in flux, mm -hmm. nothing is permanent. And so even though those stories are written there, they can have little deviations. And a good example of that is that when you look uh, many of those stories, for example, like the Three Sisters, um, Sky Bear, uh, the Hobomoks uh, legends, they appear in other tribes, but they have a little, they're a little different. And so, and that's okay. Um, and I assume someone reading them out loud could improvise or yes. tell a, a gloss, as we would say in Ireland, on the particular story that's right, written. Right, yes. So, mm -hmm. um, so I, mean, I think it's important to recognize that there, it's not, right. it's not, it's different than Western writing, which is ideas in your head that you commit to, uh, to the written word. Absolutely, is... because uh, the Western idea of thought and writing is noun oriented, yeah. And indigenous writing is verb oriented. Mm. So it's all action. Mm. So actually, when I first, um, well, especially when I, uh, during the morning wrote, I had this publisher from uh, Europe, mm. and he was very upset the way I was writing my syntax, because I used a lot of verbs, and I would change uh, 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 text every time I would change yes, uh, yeah. uh, um, and he didn't like that you know um, he says you can't do that I said yes I can <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah it doesn't have to be linear it, it, right, I right. mean and one could po point more to po poetry or the, yes. the, the poetic narrative yes. rather than a prose narrative to find a genre that's uh, right right and I think indigenous closer. narrative in itself is very prose very very poetic okay um, is there a piece that you'd like to read for us? Um, let's we didn't rehearse this, by the way. No, so. we didn't. <laughs> um, 
let's see. Uh, actually, you know what I would like to read? I think I would like to read the opening that I, that I discussed, my experience at uh, uh, um, Haskell. Uh, this is the... Um, um, I think I can do it without my glasses. I'm going to be brave. Let's see. Okay, yeah, I can. It's pretty good. So I'm going to read the forward, I think, uh, to this book. I think this would be a good uh, opening. In April of 2015, I was fortunate enough to have been invited to be a guest speaker at Haskell Indian Nations University in Kansas. It was for their sixth annual Indigenous Empowerment Summit. It was an amazing week of inspirational stories, cultural resources, music, powwow, and traditional cuisine. A special thanks to Julia Weibo for making it possible for me to be there. I was thrilled to bear witness to hundreds of young, young natives achieving academic greatness while maintaining strong ties to their culture. The most honored moment was when I was asked to do the opening prayer and song for the sunrise ceremony. The ceremony is conducted at the Sacred Medicine Wheel. This revered area of the Haskell campus is where hundreds of native children lost their lives due to abuse, neglect, and suicide during the boarding school era. Most of the graves are unmarked. It was 5 a.m. when student and committee leader of the Empowerment Summit, Chris Sendone, came to pick me up at the hotel. As we traversed the early morning roads of Lawrence, Kansas, Chris began going on giving me the layout of the morning events. I listened intently. Preparing for the ceremony is always a very serious matter. But what I found in most Native communities, including my own, a bit of levity is often the first dose of medicine. This led to our subsequent dis discussion of whether fry bread tastes better than bannock. Now, there's a lot of tribal pride throughout the United States and Canada concerning these two breads. So we were both meticulous in laying out our case of our own personal preference, which I won't mention here. Chris is currently the student senate president at Haskell. His impartiality on such matters is crucial. In addition, Mr. Sendone being a New York Yankees fan and I being a Boston Red Sox fan led to further complications. <laughs> we decided to drop the matter altogether. When we arrived at the sacred medicine wheel, the morning dew kissed the air and the night had not yet surrendered its chill. I walked with Chris to gather wood for the ceremonial fire. Many other, many other, other students at Haskell had soon joined us for ceremony. It was an honor to be there with, with these future tribal leaders and faculty working so hard to make a difference. We formed a circle, took in the moment, and prayed in silence. When the first flame of the sacred fire came forth, it reminded me of a new birth. The crackling embers and bird off in the distance singing a beautiful tune spoke first. The father's son slowly peeked. The trees that edged the horizon glinted a silhouette and blazing with a splendid orange glow. And the wetlands that bordered the medicine wheel were patched with brindle reeds that danced in the gentle wind. Ah, this was one of the most peaceful, lovely, and serene moments I can recall. Yet I was standing in a place where countless tears have fallen, cries for help ignored, and the right to exist as a Native American was denied. The beauty and blessings of a new day were all around, and it merged in my heart with the great tragedy that befell all these innocent children. I took out my drum and began singing the Nipmuc healing song. The words are in my Algonquin language, and it brought to mind how language and story were forbidden to these young souls, and more than anything else, I wanted my prayers to convey a message of survival and resistance. This is the same survival and resistance that I am also a product of. Our elders teach us that we are the answer to someone's prayer and someone's dream. So what you're about to read are indigenous tales that never made it to the ears and hearts of countless children that it was meant for. So may these stories flow on the lips of the wind and eternally whisper in the hearts of every little soul. Good to mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm struck both in your um, opening um, keynote and also in your writing that um, you can hold at the same time joy and humor and the immense tragedy and s struggle and difficulty that your people and we as part of humanity face. 
Can you reflect with us on, on how you do that and what, is that something that's specific to your people? Um, I think it's innate. I think it's, um, I think it's something that we've learned mm. to do. And I think about um, my, my, uh, my mom's brothers who all died relatively long from, young from alcoholism. And uh, not to mention so many others during that, these beautiful, handsome people dying in their 30s and 40s from, from drinking. And I remember spearfishing with them and, and seeing, them, seeing them in some of these most very sad situations and they're laughing and they're finding joy in it. Um, uh, and I especially think about my uncle, uh, his nickname was Brother, because every native person has a nickname. <laughs> That's another. Uh, so he, um, he had so much tragedy in his life, and he always gave everybody else a smile, though. Right. And, um, and I think um, it's, a, it's a mechanism to deal with trauma, I think, um, that, that we've all learned to, to, to do. Um, as I said, in, in, in native circles, everywhere I've traveled, you know, I hear this, th that laughter, the jokes. Um, and so I think it's something that we've, it's a survival tool. Okay. So be careful about romanticizing it, that it's more a coping mechanism in many cases. Yes, okay. yes. Fair enough. We're, we're gonna take a few questions um, from the audience uh, in, in a moment, and Jana will be keeping an eye on the people joining us via Zoom. Um, just before we do that, um, your achievement in getting the curriculum um, uh, approved, not an elective, formerly in the, cur in the curriculum. How did, what was your reaction when you realized that was gonna happen? At uh, Bunker Hill? Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, I work with Kevin Weary and Kim Frazier over there, and I, they're, they're phenomenal folks. Um, I've been doing some work there for four or five years now, yeah. and Kevin, uh, he, um, he was very, always very interested in developing the curriculum and the indigenous work even more, mm -hmm. something more uh, substantial and more dynamic, and so he's, this is something he's been working on for a while, and I've just been elated about it, and I'm, uh, again, this is something I thought I would never see, to have that built in. It's not just an elective anymore. People are gonna learn about us, you know, and um, we did a workshop there a couple of years ago about uh, Deer Island, and uh, we took faculty and staff out to Deer Island, mm -hmm. and uh, for those who don't know, and a lot of people didn't know, that was a place where uh, Nipmunk people were taken there by, uh, shackled in chains during the King Philip's War. Hmm. They were non-combatants, much like what happened to Japanese Americans. The same thing happened 200 years prior to Native people. And they were put on Deer Island. Many starved to death, froze to death. And we do a, a ceremony each year, uh, a sacred paddle out to Deer Island to uh, honor them. We, we had George Takai here two years ago telling some of his stories about Japanese internment. And the, the parallels are, are, as you say, striking. Um, where's Karen? Oh, there you are. Um, we have one question down here and then another one up there to get us started. Please wait till the microphone comes for you so it'll be part of the recording and everybody else can hear too. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. I have so many questions. <laughs> I'm a storyteller myself from Colombia. And uh, I guess, how do you feel about storytellers from outside who are from different nations telling stories that are traditionally from the Nidmuk people? You mean someone else telling, say someone else would tell a Nipmuc story who's not from the tribe, for example? Yes, uh, because when you write down the stories in a book, then anybody can access them and anybody can decide to tell them in their own way. Uh, I have heard that some Native American nations don't wish for other people who are not from their nation to tell their stories. How do you feel about this? Uh, I'm about the same. <laughs> uh, so. Um, a couple of interesting things I want to say about that. So the curriculum, <coughs> the other curriculum that I talked about, Circle Tied to Mother Earth, mm -hmm. which is the uh, middle school. So as I mentioned, it's based on the indigenous people of, of the land, those traditional stories. So we have native scholars training teachers how to share that book because we know they're not going to have the understanding and the, and the comprehension of, of, of understanding that the way that needs to be applied. And so we have a guide for them. Um, and so, yes, I am, um, and so it's a really um, a complex question, truthfully, I was kind of joking, but, uh, but so, because you, uh, you have like appropriation, and then you have uh, where people are trying to share your story to uplift your community and to bring notoriety to it. Those are, I think that's important. Uh, and, but it's important that they don't um, intersect, 
uh, because you know we have appropriation and, and that's that's a big problem in in, uh, in tribal communities. Um, but um, I think these books and other native writers who have published their work, they want it to be shared. They want people to know about their, their tribal community. And that's the reason why I, I want everybody to know about, I wish everybody could speak Nipmuc, right? <laughs> so I, um, I, I want to share that in that way. But again, we have people who take on these identities and then go profit from it. And, and so that's, that's still a problem. And I was struck that you, you yourself asked for permission to tell the story in this form as well. Yes. So I, that's probably a part of however the stories are to be retold. It should be with consent and with a absolutely with because nobody. Uh, so we don't. Nobody owns the stories. Okay. They're part of the. They're part of the people. They're part of the land. And so if these stories were passed down to my elders, which then came to me, so I need to be talking to people who are older, mm -hmm. who's been sharing them before I did, mm -hmm. because they're, um, they're they're a gift that I can now pass on. So I have to be responsible. And then mm -hmm. when the time comes, though, somebody will come and ask me. Mm -hmm. And these protocols help keep that respect and help keep the the sacredness and the value of it. Um, it doesn't become commodified. Uh, it doesn't become something that you can be bought and paid for. We'll take an online question while Karen goes to the next. There was somebody up above, I think, and then we'll come back to you, sir. Jonna. Larry, uh, Deborah asks, short of going to a protest, what can we who are not indigenous do to honor indigenous peoples on Thanksgiving? Um, so wherever that person is, is calling from, I would, get in, I would reach out to that local tribe. I always say work local. Uh, reach out to the local tribe that you're, the area that you're living on. That's the perfect way to get involved, I always say. Um, the most important way, I would say, to get involved because it, I see people who want to support Native people. Sometimes it's, the romanticization is never too far away and you, you may get these letters from, uh, you want to support so-and-so tribe, and the, you get these glamorous emails and so on, and you get caught up in that, not thinking about you have a tribe right in your community that has no notoriety, that doesn't have the platform to even get that far, that needs your support. So look local and, and reach out to them and see what their needs are. And um, my, uh, an ally of, uh, of mine said, them, said it most uh, succinctly that, um, when you go to an indigenous person, just say to them, what can I do? What do you need me to do? What do you need from me? And I think that's the best way. Ask and ask local. Yes. Thank you. Um, my question is very simple, I hope. <laughs> is there a website or an email, some way that I could write to you? I'm a writer also, but I mean to like, correspond with you briefly. Yes, please reach out to okiteo.org. You can How reach me. How do you spell that word, please? Uh, o H K E T E A U. And the rest, please? Dot org. And uh, okiteo is a Nipmuc word meaning a place to grow. And with the support of everybody sharing with us, we are growing. It's really living up to its name. So we're really excited about the work we're doing out there. When when the question was asked, you know, how may we be more responsive to Native people? Would you suggest purchasing Native, you know, art, cra craftsmanship? Be, you know, because there's a lot of companies, there's a lot of people now who are mar marketing their art artistic work, you know, that people would like to buy. Yeah, absolutely. Please support local indigenous artists. Um, uh, again, we had uh, we had this we had these series of panels at Okite where we bring in different people and have different discussions. And one of the topic was art and social justice. And again, we had uh, Isaac uh, Murdoch, who's the creator of the, the Th Thunderbird Woman, and uh, also uh, the Missing and Murdered uh, uh, symbol created by Susan Lund was there, was there. And they talked about how Amazon and other these other big places are are co-opting their symbol and, and selling it. And so um, it's very important that we. Uh, Again, local and, and go to the artist. Um, and by the way, in our, in our language, there's no word for art because it's all a part of our existence. These things that we now put on a wall and say that they're pretty, we're actually like using our baskets and, <laughs> and things like that, you know, putting stuff in them like, you know, corn and beans and different things. Well, we'll take one more online question and then we'll come up over to you, sir. Uh, Mary is asking um, earlier, Larry, when you talked <coughs> about the cultural center that's open, mm -hmm. she asks if the location is open to the public, 
and is it available for schools to visit? So it's it. Uh, so that's a yes or no question. It is open for uh, specific tours from educators and at schools if we had that. However, um, Okitao is a very unique place because we have two components of it. We have one component which, which is for the indigenous people to thrive, as as uh, David mentioned. It's a place for create creativity, art, from STEM to to brain tanning highs to building a machine. Uh, to dance, to art, to, to come there and study. So it's a safe place for Native people to come. But we also have a component of education where we bring in educators and schools and things like that. And those are planned visits. So folks couldn't just show up if you're not from the community to say, oh, I want to come in and see what the Indians are doing. So it's not that kind of a place. We wanted to make sure it was a safe place for our people to have that to come. And uh, again, we have that component of education that they can coordinate by contacting us and we could set those kind of things up. We, um, we've done... Uh, uh, a couple of retreats already. We've done several workshops. We did different fellowship workshops for different dance theater companies and things like that, and and uh, ped pedagogies and so on. So we're we, we're able to, to to do that. Hey. Hey. Well, thanks so much for for sharing everything. And uh, yeah, a question that's that's come to me recently. I live in in southern Mexico, in um, the Central Valley, uh, with the Zapotec people. Uh, for about 10 years, and so I've come to kind of understand what it means, you know, to live amongst the people who are connected to the land as they always have been, and a lot of really interesting thoughts have come to my mind, uh, originally from the South Shore of Massachusetts, and uh, have, you know, come to understand how, you know, linked Massachusetts is to, to Mexico in terms of how, you know, corn made its way up, and the, the milpa system, which is, you know, th what they termed the three sisters uh, here that supposedly began with the English you know, colonists. But it's opened up so many questions living there and it's really taken me back to my education in, in Hingham and thinking that the only piece of education that I had about the land that I was living on was from um, an Algonquin on a field trip and telling us about these different plants. And I've you know, been thinking, well, that was of all the, the grades that I go through, this is the only day in which there is any education provided for us about the trees and the lands that surround us. And I'm going to ask you to land on a question, please. Yeah, so it, it's come to really, uh, to me, feel like, wow, it's just such a, such a repression uh, to have an educational system that intentionally just totally segregates you from your land. And uh, as you mentioned, you know, there's, there's changes in politics, maybe in, in powers, a bit in sway. And I'm curious to know if there's been an increase in kind of white people coming to your tribe and, and other nations in interest in, in being able to connect with the lands that they're so-called from as well. Um, yeah, so um, I think a lot of the uh, success that we have would not be possible without allies, the allyship that, that's available now. Um, and I also think you're, you're, you're also kind of going in the direction of our white folks coming to kind of take part in ceremony as well. Is that what you're, um, and so that, that becomes again, again a, I think a complex um, question in terms of how close they are to the tribe, if they're gonna have access to that, because again, um, I don't think it was meant to be esoteric, but because of the, again, the, ex the exploitation and, and the different things like that, that's sometimes not acceptable. Um, but I do wanna mention, you talked about Central Mexico, uh, and so uh, Cancantu, the crow, is the bringer, and, and I, because I'm, I'm a lover of mythology from all over the world as well, but as a, as a study of um, this, so it's very important to me to learn about what other people are saying. And so um, there's a story from your area that the raven brought the corn as well down in central Mexico. And it's really kind of crazy that we have the same story here about the crow bringing the corn. And so that was, it, it really blew my mind when I read that story. Uh, um, and so you see this connection that you're talking about. And then going a little further, uh, Morgan, the raven, in uh, the Druid Celtic Society in Ireland is the shapeshifter, and that's the same here. Mm -hmm. And so it's just really fascinating. You know, these traditional indigenous cultures have these kind of um, uh, connections mm -hmm. across spaces, you know, in time. It, it's, it's almost like Western evolution from the Middle Ages, as we would consider it in Europe, through to, you know, the middle of the 19th century, lost its way and became disconnected from land, story, um, earth, air, uh, the elemental parts that are 
you know, present in your culture and certainly in the history of mine growing up in Ireland and so, and, and perhaps in, in, in yours as well. So it's, it's, it's healing for the whole species that we, we have to be engaged in. Um, absolutely, think, absolutely. Um, we're gonna take one more question and then we're gonna ask um, Larry to share in, in another medium. Mm -hmm. And if we have time at the end, we'll come back and ask a, a couple more questions. Right. Hi, um, thank you so much. This has been just wonderful. Uh, I am keenly interested to hear more about the Nipmuc Preservation Trust, a little bit about the history, how it started, and what it is. Oh, great. I wish my cousin Fred Freeman was here, but he's up at the, the, the dugout canoe today. So Fred, uh, he's the president of that organization, and you can find them on Facebook, or you can reach the Oki Teo, and I can get you in contact with them. So. Um, the Nipmuc Preservation Trust started um, um, with a friend of mine from the uh, uh, Mass Autobahn, and um, who, um, so just to even back up further, I don't have time to get too much into the story, but um, as the work that I've been doing in about, uh, I think it was about 2000, maybe 1999, I wrote, uh, uh, what's that department? Uh, the, the Massachusetts Department of Land Management. I wrote them a, a very nice letter asking them to give us our land back. And, uh, and, uh, my friend there, Bob, Robert O'Connor, anybody know him? He, uh, he actually responded to it. And he says, uh, he says, he says, Larry, you know, um, he says, you blew my mind. And I, this is, I didn't know him at the time. We didn't even know, we were strangers. I just wrote him a letter and I said, I wrote, I lay, laid out why you should give it back. And he said, uh, he says, I wish I could give it all back to you. He says, but you know what I want to do? I want to get you in contact with some people who can get you your, some Nipmuc land back. And so that, from that day, that led the process to working with the Quabbin Land Trust and different folks, organizations uh, in and of themselves to try to get us uh, some land returned. Um, unfortunately, some of that fell through. Um, but by that time, our tribe, our tribal communities were organized in a way that we said, we're gonna start our own land trust. And that's what we did. And so that was kind of the genesis of how that started. And uh, I think it started with five acres. Um, and we just got, we, we do a lot of work out in Petersham. We got 40 acres there. Then we got another 50 acres in Hubbardston. We're gonna be getting some more uh, acreage up in Gardner, I, I think, and it just keeps growing. And uh, we're, we're doing harvesting, we're doing different things on the land, uh, doing su different sustainable things. Um, we have uh, young Nipmuc scholars who are doing a lot of sustain sustainability work with foods. Uh, so it's really amazing that the, the young folks are doing. Um, well, we're gonna bring the standing mic over okay. and uh, get you to maybe ask right. what you're gonna share with us next. All right. Share some songs. Usually I sing in the first, in the beginning, so this is kind of kind of neat to sing at the end. So I think I'm going to start. No, I'll start with the drum. I never know what I'm going to do until it happens. Well, we're, we're entirely in your hands. Yes. So, um, I want to thank you all for uh, listening. And um, I, I really encourage you to um, get involved and uh, do some research because, uh, I mean, I can only share so much in this little bit of time. And we're talking about, uh, a lot of times people think Native history starts in 1492, but we're talking about thousands of years of history about, and living presence. So history and presence, that's important. And uh, one of the most important things I learned that I'm gonna share with you right now is about this right here. This is the heartbeat of the people, and this, everything happens through this. Can you tell me what that sounds like? Right. And so I would ask you now to just do a little something. Could you look to the person to your left? Your other left, sir. <laughs> now look to the person to your right. Okay. Now the reason why I ask that is because what you may have noticed is that the person you just looked at is may not be the same gender, they may not have the same skin color, they may not have the same hair, maybe no hair, and it's all right. But on the inside, everybody is doing this. We're all the same. So if you start looking at the heart when you're talking to somebody, all that other stuff just melts away, it fades away. It's so insignificant about what we're looking at. But you're talking to another heartbeat. And this goes for all the different other living things. 
that means not just the animals, but the plants and the animals and the water, all living elements. Anybody take science class, right? On the molecular level, we're all the same stuff. And um, in our native culture, we call that all, all my relations. In science, they call it quantum physics. <laughs> so with that, I want to share, share a couple songs here. because the allergies have got the best of me. If I sound a little stuffy, it's been, oh, hay fever or whatever kind of fever it's called. Oh, year round, man, it's bad stuff. Um, so I want to I wanna come back to the drum, but I want to share a little bit of a rattle song here. Did you guys like that? Yeah. All right, so here's a song here. This is um, the style of singing that we did in our, um, what we call longhouse songs or social songs. These songs would go all night long sometime. Um, and so, and they were, because they were social songs, they were about different things, about um, uh, just coming together and having a real good time, having like giveaways and different kinds of moon ceremonies and things like that. And we would sing a song like this. And, were, and these songs are sung by many communities here, the uh, uh, Algonquin people and the uh, Haudenosaunee people as well. Hey <laughs> You guys like that? Um, okay, so you guys ready to try it? Uh, all right, so I sang this is this now I'm going to give you guys an opportunity to sing. Um, because I, as I said, the allergies are bothering me, so I'm going to let you guys jump in with this. All right, so it's going to be another social song, and I'm going to go through it one time, then I'm going to let you guys do it. <clears throat> this is an um, alligator song. Okay. 
Your turn. <laughs> Ready? One, two, three. Oh. <laughs> okay, I have an idea. I have an idea. I have an idea. Okay. These, these folks right here, I want to ask you to do something for me. Just these folks right here. Say, yo ho. Yo ho. Diaphragm. Yo ho. Yo ho. Okay. These center folks right here say, we ha. We ha. And the folks over here say, yo, hey. Yo, hey. Yeah, yo, hey. Okay. Okay, so once again, over here, yo ho. We ha. Okay, one more time. Okay, lively, lively, lively. Okay, yo ho, we ha, yo, hey. Okay, so now, I gave you your, your part. That's what you're going to sing. That's your section. Uh, when I kill you, you're going to go, and uh, I'll do my part, and you're going to do uh, your part, and we're going to have a good time. Here we go. We're gonna, we're, it's going gonna, it's gonna to work, David. Trust me. Hi-ya! <laughs> All right. Woo. <laughs> All right, give yourself a hand. Everybody's going home singing a social traditional song today. What was that? What did we say? What did we say? Okay. I'm glad you asked that. I want to first, before I answer that question, I have to ask you a question first. Since we're getting to that time of the year, this is a song that you're probably going to hear. And I'm going to sing this song. Then I'm going to ask you, what do these words mean? And it goes something like this. Uh, Tis the seasons to be jolly. Fa la 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 la. Could you please tell me what la 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 means? <laughs> yes. So, um, so yes, right. And so these are. So having said that, and I always like to use that example because um, we have no idea. Um, so indigenous music has a different, there's different styles of it. There's, um, there's what we call the chants, where there are seemingly no words in it. Um, and then there are songs with, as it, I'm probably getting over, there, then there are songs with words in it. So what, what, I was, what we were taught, um, these songs that don't have words, as it were, are songs that are so old, like um, that the words are gone, and then they just become a medicine of that. For example, you might not know the words of this song, but you still like it. <laughs> All right, anybody know that song? Oh my God. Billie Jean, Michael Jackson, no? What do I, what's the modern music now? I don't know. Um, Jonas Brothers, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't listen to it much. Um, <laughs> all right, so, so here's a song, um, and I'm going to do uh, a couple. I'm going to do this song, which is, as I was just mentioning, this is what we call a straight style of, style of powwow song. So when we were on the trail during the powwows, we would sing this kind of a song, but it would be on, um, it would be on a big drum. Wait, I think my water, oh, okay, I'm over here. So you'd hear this kind of song. I'm going to give you a demonstration. And by the way, if it wasn't for the pandemic, everybody would be up here dancing. We'd be doing all kinds of fun stuff. So as, um, as you mentioned earlier, it's, too, it's so unfortunate that we can't um, exchange that way we used to. But I mean, this is, we're making the best of it. So I'm really glad you're all here. So here we go. Wait up!
So, I don't know how are we on time. Okay, um, so I'm going to share this other song. Um, and so, something that a native people uh, native people do uh, across the powwow trail is share music uh, with each other. Um, and so, um, and again, these are things that you do and you ask permission for because even and this is something that's important to know when we talk about the lateral stuff is that. Even if it's a native person talking to another native person, it's important to ask permission. Uh, just because you're, you can be indigenous, but you gotta be the right guy uh, in, that, in that land space, you know, because it's, you know, if I went down to Mexico into a tribal village and just started, like, you know, bossing people around, it'd be very rude and I might not come back here, you know, <coughs> and rightly so. <coughs> and so it's important to have that respect. And so um, we were out in the powwow trail, we sang many different styles of songs. Uh, so we have songs that are in Cree, uh, Mi'kmaq, Mi'kmaq, uh, of course, Algonquin language, um, Ojibwe, and uh, Diné, Navajo language. And so this next song I'm going to share with you is in the Navajo Diné language. And so I don't know if you'll be able to, well, I didn't sing in uh, Algonquin, so I'll have to sing in Algonquin language so you can see the difference. So I'll share this. Uh, this is in a Diné, very different language um, than our own. And um, this was a song that we would sing. <coughs> This next song is uh, in our Nipmunk language. This is a song I actually wrote it's, uh, when we were singing, and it has to do with my boys. And, um, and in, this, in this song, you know, Gakwin language, I'm talking about come out to the circle, have a good time, and you're, you got all my boys here, we're, we're singing for you, so just come on out and, and sing with us. <laughs> Oh, 
Let's see. Let's see. You guys want a round dance style or a straight style, like the fast or slow? You guys tell me. Fast. Fast? fast? OK, let's see. Uh, uh, OK, let's see. Something fast. Sometimes you, the songs that will come to you, they're all up there just swimming around. It's like a slot thing, which one falls in? Let's see. questions and I know a lot of you have more questions but we're right at time so oh. we'll, we'll, we'll but okay I want to do this go right ahead <laughs> I want to do this last one because I want to and okay all right so this song is a nipmunk paddle song because I want to do this because we're making this traditional machine burnout dugout canoe that's something that has not happened in hundreds of years on nipmunk land building our own canoe the way our ancestors did uh Noki Teo is able to provide that, the resource to make this happen. So this is one of our traditional paddle songs, and it's in our language. And um, the words are, uh, we live for the water, water is life, paddle strong, warriors, paddle strong. And now when I say warrior, it's not gender specific in our language. Uh, so warrior has nothing to do with gender, and unfortunately it kind of got all screwed up in English, but so that's what the words are. Yeah, hey, na, we, ya, we, na, we, ya, na, we, ya, na, we, ha, na, ha, ya, na, we, ha, ha, na, we, ha, na, we, ya, na, we, ya, na, we, ha, na, ha, ya, na, we, ya, na, we, ha, na, ya, we, ya, he, ya, we, na, kiti yang nu we chi nipi ya we ya. Nipi kiti yang nu we chi ni na wan. Chemo che mo na ke, chemo che mo na ke, chemo che mo na ke, ya he ya. Ya he ya he ya we na. He ya na we ya na we na. Ha ya na we ya na we na. We ya na he ya na we na. 
Thank you. Well, Larry, once again, Larry Spotted Crow Man, thank, thank you so much for sharing your story, yourself, your accomplishments, your struggle, your joy, your humor, your music. Uh, it's been a pleasure. We, we, we have so much to learn from you. Thank you, you so much. It's thank you for having me. Thank it's you. been a fun, it's been fun. Thank you all. And just a couple of notes about upcoming programs. On November 29th, uh, our next author talk series that I'll be hosting is with Kyle Mays on his new book, An Afro-Indigenous History of the United States. And then on December 4th, we'll have Nora McInerney, an author and podcaster whose work on grief and resiliency centers on her experiences as a young widow. And so we're looking forward to having both of those guests. For more about these programs and others, uh, please check out our website, whether you're joining us online or in person at www.bpl.org. Until next time, please be well, be safe. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.